Part 4 April 29th, 1992 Dear friend, I wish I could report that it's getting better, but unfortunately it isn't. It's hard, too, because we've started school again, and I can't go to the places where I used to go. And it can't be like it was. And I wasn't ready to say goodbye just yet. To tell you the truth, I've just been avoiding everything. I walk around the school hallways and look at the people. I look at the teachers and wonder why they're here. If they like their jobs, or us. And I wonder how smart they were when they were fifteen. Not in a mean way, in a curious way. It's like looking at all the students and wondering who's had their heart broken that day, and how they are able to cope with having three quizzes and a book report on top of that. Or wondering who did the heartbreaking, and wondering why. Especially since I know that if they went to another school, the person who had their heart broken would have had their heart broken by somebody else, so why does it have to be so personal? And if I went to another school, I would never have known Sam or Patrick or Mary Elizabeth or anyone except my family. I can tell you one thing that happened. I was in the shopping mall because that's where I go lately. For the last couple of weeks, I've been going there every day, trying to figure out why people go there. It's kind of a personal project. There was this one little boy. He might have been four years old, I'm not sure. He was crying really hard, and he kept screaming for his mom. He must have been lost. Then I saw this older kid who was maybe 17. I think he went to a different school because I had never seen him before. Anyway, this older kid who was really tough-looking with a leather jacket and long hair and everything, went up to the little boy and asked him what his name was. The little boy answered and stopped crying. Then, the older kid walked away with the little boy. A minute later, I heard the intercom say to the mom that her boy was at the information desk. So I went to the information desk to see what would happen. I guess the mom had been searching for the little boy for a long time because she came running up to the information desk, and when she saw the little boy, she started crying. She held him tightly and told him to never run off again. Then she thanked the older kid who had helped, and all the older kid said was, Next time, just watch him a little fucking better. Then he walked away. The man with the mustache behind the information desk was speechless. So was the mom. The little boy just wiped his nose, looked up at his mom, and said, French fries. The mom looked down at the little boy and nodded, and they left. So I followed them. They went to the place where the food stands are, and they got French fries. The little boy was smiling and getting ketchup all over himself and the mom kept wiping his face in between, taking drags of her cigarette. I kept looking at the mom, trying to imagine what she must have looked like when she was young. If she was married. If her little boy was an accident or planned. And if that made a difference. I saw other people there. Old men sitting alone, young girls with blue eyeshadow and awkward jaws, little kids who looked tired. Fathers in nice coats who looked even more tired. Kids working behind the counters of the food places who looked like they hadn't had the will to live for hours. The machines kept opening and closing. The people kept giving money and getting their change. And it all felt very unsettling to me. So I decided to find another place to go and figure out why people go there. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of places like that. I don't know how much longer I can keep going without a friend. I used to be able to do it very easily, but that was before I knew what having a friend was like. It's much easier not to know things sometimes, and to have french fries with your mom be enough. The only person I've really talked to in the last two weeks was Susan, the girl who used to go with Michael back in middle school when she had braces. I saw her standing in the hall, surrounded by a group of boys I didn't know. They were all laughing and making sex jokes, and Susan was doing her best to laugh along with them. When she saw me approaching the group, her face went ashen. 
It was almost like she didn't want to remember what she was like twelve months ago, and she certainly didn't want the boys to know that she knew me and used to be my friend. The whole group got quiet and stared at me, but I didn't even notice them. I just looked at Susan, and all I said was, Do you ever miss him? I didn't say it mean or accusingly. I just wanted to know if anybody else remembered Michael. To tell you the truth, I was stoned in a bad way, and I couldn't get the question out of my mind. Susan was at a loss. She didn't know what to do. These were the first words we had spoken since the end of last year. I guess it wasn't fair of me to ask her in a group like that, but I never see her by herself anymore, and I really needed to know. At first, I thought her blank expression was the result of surprise, but after it didn't go away for a long while, I knew that it wasn't. It suddenly dawned on me that if Michael were still around, Susan probably wouldn't be going out with him anymore. Not because she's a bad person or shallow or mean, just because things change, and friends leave, and life doesn't stop for anybody. I'm sorry I bothered you, Susan. I'm just having a tough time, that's all. Have a good one, I said and walked away. God, that kid is such a fucking freak, I heard one of the boys whisper when I was halfway down the hall. He said it more factual than mean, and Susan didn't correct him. I don't know if I would have corrected him myself these days. Love always, Charlie. May 2nd, 1992 Dear friend, a few days ago I went to see Bob and buy more pot. I should probably say that I keep forgetting Bob doesn't go to school with us. Probably because he watches more television than anyone I know, and he's great with trivia. You should see him talk about Mary Tyler Moore. It's kind of spooky. Bob has his very specific way of living. He says he takes a shower every other day. He weighs his stash daily. He says when you're smoking a cigarette with someone and you have a lighter, you should light their cigarette first. But if you have matches, you should light your cigarette first so you breathe in the harmful sulfur instead of them. He says it's the polite thing to do. He also says it's bad luck to have three on a match. He heard that from his uncle, who fought in Vietnam. Something about how three cigarettes was enough time for the enemy to know where you are. Bob says that when you're alone, and you light a cigarette, and the cigarette is only halfway lit, that means someone is thinking about you. He also says that when you find a penny, it's only lucky if it's heads up. He says the best thing to do is find a lucky penny when you're with someone, and give the other person the good luck. He believes in karma. He also loves to play cards. Bob goes part-time to the local community college. He wants to be a chef. He's an only child, and his parents are never home. He says it used to bother him a lot when he was younger, but not so much anymore. The thing about Bob is that when you first meet him, he's really interesting because he knows about cigarette rules and pennies and Mary Tyler Moore. But after you've known him for a while, he starts to repeat these things. In the last few weeks, he hasn't said anything that I haven't heard from him before. That's what made it such a shock when he told me what happened. Basically, Brad's father caught Patrick and Brad together. I guess that Brad's father didn't know about his son because when he caught them, Brad's father started beating Brad. Not a slap kind of beating, a belt kind. A real kind. Patrick told Sam who told Bob that he had never seen anything like it. I guess it was that bad. He wanted to say, stop, and you're killing him. He even wanted to hold Brad's father down, but he just froze. And Brad kept yelling, get out to Patrick, and finally Patrick just did. That was last week, and Brad still hasn't come to school. Everyone thinks he might have been sent to the military school or something. Nobody knows for sure about anything. Patrick tried calling once, but when Brad's father answered, he just hung up. Bob said Patrick was in bad shape. I can't tell you how sad I felt when he told me that because I wanted to call Patrick and be his friend and help him. 
but I didn't know if I should call him because of what he said about waiting until things got clear. The thing was, I couldn't think about anything else. So, on Friday, I went to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I waited until the movie had already started before I went into the theater. I didn't want to ruin the show for everybody. I just wanted to see Patrick play Frankenfurter just like he always does, because I knew if I saw that, I knew he would be okay. Just like my sister getting mad at me for smoking cigarettes. I sat in the back row and looked on the stage. It was still a couple of scenes before Frankenfurter enters. That's when I saw Sam playing Janet, and I missed her so much. And I was so sorry about how I messed everything up. Especially when I saw Mary Elizabeth play Magenta. It was all very hard to watch. But then Patrick finally came on as Frankenfurter, and he was great. He was actually better than ever in a lot of ways. It was just so nice to see all my friends. I left before the movie was over. I drove home listening to some of the songs we listened to those times when we were infinite. And I pretended they were in the car with me. I even talked out loud. I told Patrick how I thought he was great. I asked Sam about Craig. I told Mary Elizabeth that I was sorry and how much I really loved the E.E. E. Cummings book and wanted to ask her questions about it. But then I stopped because it started to make me too sad. I also thought that if anybody saw me talking out loud when I was alone in the car, their looks might convince me that the something that's wrong with me might even be worse than I thought. When I got home, my sister was watching a movie with her new boyfriend. There isn't much to say other than his name is Eric, and he has short hair and is junior. Eric had rented the movie. After I shook hands with him, I asked him about the movie because I didn't recognize it, except for an actor who used to be on a TV show, and I couldn't remember his name. My sister said, It's stupid. You wouldn't like it. I said, What's it about? She said, Come on, Charlie, it's almost over. I said, Would it be okay if I watched the end? She said, You can watch it when we're done. I said, well, how about I watch the end with you, and then I can rewind it and watch up to the point I started watching with you. That's when she paused the movie. Can't you take a hint? I suppose not. You want to be alone, Charlie? Oh, I'm sorry. To tell you the truth, I knew she wanted to be alone with Eric, but I really wanted to have some company. I knew it wasn't fair, though, to ruin her time just because I miss everybody, so I just said good night and left. I went up to my room and started reading the new book Bill gave me. It's called The Stranger. Bill said it's very easy to read, but very hard to read well. I have no idea what he means, but I like the book so far. Love always, Charlie. May 8th, 1992 Dear Friend, It's strange how things can change back as suddenly as they changed originally. When one thing happens, and suddenly, things are back to normal. On Monday, Brad came back to school. He looked very different. It wasn't that he was bruised or anything. His face actually looked fine. But before, Brad was always this guy who walked down the hallway with a bounce. I can't really describe it any other way. It's just that some people walk with their heads to the ground for some reason. They don't like to look other people in the eye. Brad was never like that, but now he is, especially when it comes to Patrick. I saw them talking quiet in the hallway. I was too far away to hear what they said, but I could tell that Brad was ignoring Patrick. And when Patrick started to get upset, Brad just closed his locker and walked away. It wasn't that strange because Brad and Patrick never talked in school since Brad wanted things to be secret. The strange part was that Patrick would walk up to Brad in the first place. So, I guess that they didn't meet in the golf courses anymore, or talk on the phone even. Later that evening, I was having a cigarette outside by myself, and I saw Patrick alone also having a cigarette. I wasn't close enough to really see him, but I didn't want to interfere with his personal time, so I didn't walk up to him. But Patrick was crying. 
He was crying pretty hard. After that, whenever I saw him around anywhere, he didn't look like he was there. He looked like he was somewhere else. And I think I knew that because that's how people used to say I was. Maybe they still do. I'm not sure. On Thursday, something really terrible happened. I was sitting alone in the cafeteria, eating Salisbury steak, when I saw Patrick walk up to Brad, who was sitting with his football buddies, and I saw Brad ignore him like he did at the locker. And I saw Patrick getting really upset, but Brad still ignored him. Then I saw Patrick say something, and he looked pretty angry as he turned to walk away. Brad sat still for a second, then he turned around. And then I heard it. It was just loud enough for a few tables to hear. The thing that Brad yelled at Patrick. Faggot! Brad's football buddies start laughing. A few tables got quiet as Patrick turned around. He was mad as hell. I'm not kidding. He stormed up to Brad's table and said, What did you call me? God, he was mad. I've never seen Patrick like that before. Brad sat quiet for a second, but his buddies kept egging him on by pushing his shoulders. Brad looked up at Patrick and said softer and meaner than the last time, I called you a faggot. Brad's buddies started laughing even harder. That is, until Patrick threw the first punch. It's kind of eerie when a whole room gets quiet at once, and then the real noise starts. The fight was hard, a lot harder than the one I had with Sean last year. There was no clean punching or things you see in movies. They just wrestled and hit, and whoever was the most aggressive or the most angry got in the most hits. In this case, it was pretty even until Brad's buddies got involved, and it became five to one. That's when I got involved. I just couldn't watch them hurt Patrick even if things weren't clear just yet. I think anyone who knew me might have been frightened or confused. Except maybe my brother. He taught me what to do in these situations. I don't really want to go into detail, except to say that by the end of it, Brad and two of his buddies stopped fighting and just stared at me. His other two friends were lying on the ground. One was clutching the knee I bashed in with one of those metal cafeteria chairs. The other was holding his face. I kind of swiped at his eyes, but not too bad. I didn't want to be too bad. I looked down at the ground, and I saw Patrick. His face was pretty messed up, and he was crying hard. I helped him to his feet, and then I looked at Brad. I don't think we'd ever really exchanged two words before, but I guess this was the time to start. All I said was, If you ever do this again, I'll tell everyone. And if that doesn't work, I'll blind you. I pointed at his friend who was holding his face, and I knew Brad heard me and knew that I meant it. He didn't say anything back, though, because the security guards of our school came to bring all of us out of the cafeteria. They took us first to the nurse, and then to Mr. Small. Patrick started the fight, so he was suspended for a week. Brad's buddies got three days each for ganging up on Patrick after they broke up the original fight. Brad wasn't suspended at all because it was self-defense. I didn't get suspended either because I was just helping to defend a friend when it was five to one. Brad and I got a month's detention starting that day. In detention, Mr. Harris didn't set up any rules. He just let us read or do homework or talk. It really isn't much of a punishment unless you like the television programs right after school or are very concerned with your permanent record. I wonder if it's all a lie. A permanent record, I mean. On that first day of detention, Brad came to sit next to me. He looked very sad. I think it all kind of hit him after he stopped feeling numb from the fight. Charlie? Yeah? Thanks. Thanks for stopping them. You're welcome. And that was it. I haven't said anything to him since. 
and he didn't sit next to me today. At first, when he said it, I was kind of confused. But then I think I got it. Because I wouldn't want a bunch of my friends beating up Sam, even if I wasn't allowed to like her anymore either. When I got out of detention that day, Sam was waiting for me. The minute I saw her, she smiled. I was numb. I just couldn't believe she was really there. Then I saw her turn and give Brad a real cold look. Brad said, Tell him I'm sorry. Sam replied, Tell him yourself. Brad looked away and walked to his car. Then Sam walked up to me and messed up my hair. So I heard you're this ninja or something. I think I nodded. Sam drove me home in her pickup truck. On the way, she told me that she was really angry at me for doing what I did to Mary Elizabeth. She told me that Mary Elizabeth is a really old friend of hers. She even reminded me that Mary Elizabeth was there for her when she went through that tough time she told me about when she gave me the typewriter. I don't really want to repeat what that was. So, she said that when I kissed her instead of Mary Elizabeth... I really hurt their friendship for a while. Because I guess Mary Elizabeth really liked me a lot. That made me feel sad because I didn't know that she liked me that much. I just thought she wanted to expose me to all those great things. That's when Sam said, Charlie, you're so stupid sometimes. Do you know that? Yeah, I really do. Know that. Honest. Then she said that Mary Elizabeth and she got over it and she thanked me for taking Patrick's advice and staying away for as long as I did because it made things easier. So then I said, So, can we be friends now? Of course, was all she said. And Patrick? And Patrick. And everyone else? And everyone else. That's when I started crying. But Sam told me to shush. You remember what I said to Brad? Yeah. You told him that he should tell Patrick that he was sorry himself. That goes for Mary Elizabeth, too. I tried, but she told me, I know you tried, but I'm telling you to try again. Okay. Sam dropped me off. When she was too far away to see me, I started to cry again. Because she was my friend again. And that was enough for me. So... I made myself promise to never mess up like I did before. And I'm never going to, I can tell you that. When I went to the Rocky Horror Picture Show tonight, it was very tense. Not because of Mary Elizabeth. That was actually okay. I said I was sorry, and then I asked her if there was anything she wanted to say to me. And like before, I asked a question, and I got a very long answer. When I was done listening, I really did listen. I said I was sorry again. Then she thanked me for not trying to make what I did seem less by offering a lot of excuses. And things were back to normal, except we were just friends. To tell you the truth, I think the biggest reason for everything being okay is that Mary Elizabeth started dating one of Craig's friends. His name is Peter, and he's in college, which makes Mary Elizabeth happy. At the party at Craig's apartment... I overheard Mary Elizabeth say to Alice that she was much happier with Peter because he was opinionated and they had debates. She said that I was really sweet and understanding and that our relationship was too one-sided. She wanted a person that was more open to discussion and didn't need someone's permission to talk. I wanted to laugh or maybe get mad or maybe shrug at how strange everyone was, especially me. But I was at a party with my friends, so it really didn't matter that much. I just drank because I figured that it was about time to stop smoking so much pot. The thing that made the evening tense was Patrick officially quit doing Frankenfurter in the show. He said that he didn't want to do it anymore. Ever. So, he sat and watched the show in the audience with me. And he said things that were hard to listen to because Patrick usually isn't unhappy. You ever think, Charlie, that our group is the same as any other group, like the football team? And the only real difference between us is what we wear and why we wear it? Yeah? And...
and there was this pause. Well, I think it's all bullshit. And he meant it. It was hard to see him mean it that much. Some guy that I didn't know from somewhere else did the part of Frankenverter. He had been the second to Patrick for a long time, and now he got his chance. He was pretty good, too. Not as good as Patrick, but pretty good. Love always, Charlie. May 11th, 1992 Dear friend, I've been spending a lot of time with Patrick these days. I really haven't said much. I just kind of listen and nod because Patrick needs to talk. And it isn't like it was with Mary Elizabeth. It's different. It started out on the Saturday morning after the show. I was in my bed trying to figure out why sometimes you can wake up and go back to sleep and other times you can't. Then my mom knocked. Your friend Patrick's on the phone. So I got up and wiped away the sleep. Hello? Get dressed. I'm on my way. Click. That was it. I actually had a lot of work to do since it was getting closer to the end of the school year. But it sounded like we might be having some kind of adventure, so I got dressed anyway. Patrick pulled up about ten minutes later. He was wearing the same clothes he wore the night before. He hadn't showered or anything. I don't even think he went to bed. He was just wide awake on coffee and cigarettes and mini thins, which are these small pills you can buy at quick marts and truck shops. They keep you awake. They're not illegal either, but they make you thirsty. So I climbed in Patrick's car, which was filled with cigarette smoke. He offered me one, but I said not in front of my house. Your parents don't know you smoke? No, should they? Mm, I guess not. Then we started driving. Fast. At first, Patrick didn't say much. He just listened to the music on the tape player. After the second song started, I asked him if it was the mixtape I made him for Secret Santa Christmas. I've been listening to it all night. Patrick had this smile all over his face. It was a sick smile, glazy and numb. He just turned up the volume and drove faster. I'll tell you something, Charlie. I feel good. You know what I mean? Really good. Like I'm free or something. Like, I don't have to pretend anymore. I'm going away to college, right? It'll be different there. You know what I mean? Sure, I said. I've been thinking all night about what kind of posters I want to put up in my dorm room. And if I'll have an exposed brick wall. I've always wanted an exposed brick wall so I can paint it. You know what I mean? I just nodded this time because he didn't really wait for a sure. Things will be different there. They have to be. They will be, I said. You really think so? Sure. Thanks, Charlie. That's kind of how it went all day. We went to see a movie, and we ate pizza, and every time Patrick started getting tired, we got coffee, and he ate another mini-thin or two. When things started turning dusk outside, he showed me all the places he and Brad would meet. He didn't say much about them. He just stared. We ended up at the golf course. We sat on the 18th green, which was pretty high on a hill, and we watched the sun disappear. By this point, Patrick had bought a bottle of red wine with his fake ID, and we passed it back and forth, just talking. Did you hear about Lily? he asked. Who? Lily Miller. I don't know what her real first name was, but they called her Lily. She was a senior when I was a sophomore. I don't think so. I thought your brother would have told you. It's a classic. Maybe. Okay, well, stop me if you've heard it. Okay. So, Lily comes up here with this guy who is the lead in all the plays? Parker? Right, Parker. How did you know? Uh, my sister had a crush on him. Perfect! We were getting pretty drunk. So, Parker and Lily come up here for one night, and they are so in love. He gave her his thespian pin or something. At this point, Patrick is spitting out wine between sentences. He's laughing so hard. They even had a song. Something like Broken Wings by that band, Mr. Mister. Uh, I don't even know, but I hope it was Broken Wings because it would make the story perfect. Keep going, I encouraged. Okay, <laughs> okay, he swallowed. So, 
They've been going out for a long time, and I think they've even had sex before, but this was going to be a special night. She packed a little picnic, and she brought a boombox to play Broken Wings. Patrick just couldn't get over that song. He laughed for ten minutes. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> So they have this picnic with sandwiches and everything. <laughs> they start to make out. The stereo's played, and they're just about to do it when Parker realizes he forgot the condoms. <laughs> they're both naked on this putty green. They both want each other. There's no condom. So what do you think happened? I don't know. They did it doggy style with one of the sandwich bags. No, was all I could really say. Yes, was Patrick's rebuttal. God, was my counter. Yes, was Patrick's conclusion. After we shook off the giggles and wasted most of the wine and spit takes, he turned to me. And you know what the best part was? What? She was the valedictorian, and everyone knew it when she went up to give her speech. There's nothing like the deep breaths after laughing that hard. Nothing in the world like a sore stomach for the right reasons. It was that great. So, Patrick and I started sharing all the stories we could think of. There was a kid named Barry who used to build kites in art class. Then, after school, he would attach firecrackers to the kite and fly it and blow it up. He's now studying to be an air traffic controller. That was Patrick's story via Sam. And then there was this kid named Chip who spent all of his money from allowance and Christmas and birthdays to buy bug-killing equipment, and he would go door-to-door -door asking if he could kill the bugs for free. That was my story via my sister. There was a guy named Carl Burns, and everyone called him CB. And one day, CB got so drunk at a party that he tried to fuck the host's dog. That was Patrick's story. And there was this guy they called Action Jack because supposedly he was caught masturbating at a drunk party. And at every pep rally, the kids would clap and chant, Action Jack! Clap, clap, clap! Action Jack! That was my story via my brother. There were other stories and other names. Second base Stace, who had breasts in the fourth grade and let some of the boys feel them. Vincent, who took acid and tried to flush the sofa down the toilet. Sheila, who allegedly masturbated with a hot dog and had to go to the emergency room. The list went on and on. By the end, all I could think was what these people must feel like when they go to their class reunions. I wonder if they're embarrassed, and I wonder if that's a small price to pay for being a legend. After we sobered up a bit with coffee and mini thins, Patrick drove me home. The mixtape I made for him hit a bunch of winter songs, and Patrick turned to me. Thanks, Charlie. Sure. No, I mean in the cafeteria. Sure. After that, it was quiet. He drove me home and pulled up in the driveway. We hugged goodnight, and when I was just about to let go, he held me a little tighter. And he moved his face to mine. And he kissed me. A real kiss. Then... He pulled away real slow. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Really, I'm sorry. No, really. It was okay. So he said thanks and hugged me again. And moved in to kiss me again. And I just let him. I don't know why. We stayed in his car for a long time. We didn't do anything other than kiss. And we didn't even do that for a long time. After a while, his eyes lost the glazy numb look from the wine or the coffee or the fact that he had stayed up the night before. Then he started crying. Then he started talking about Brad. And I just let him. Because that's what friends are for. Love always, Charlie. May 17th, 1992. Dear friend, it seems like every morning since that first night, I wake up dull and my head hurts and I can't breathe. 
Patrick and I have been spending a lot of time together. We drink a lot. Actually, it's more like Patrick drinks and I sip. It's just hard to see a friend hurt this much. Especially when you can't do anything except be there. I want to make him stop hurting, but I can't. So I just follow him around whenever he wants to show me his world. One night, Patrick took me to this park where men go to find each other. Patrick told me that if I didn't want to be bothered by anyone, that I should just not make eye contact. He said that eye contact is how you agree to fool around anonymously. Nobody talks. They just find places to go. After a while, Patrick saw someone he liked. He asked me if I needed any cigarettes, and when I said no, he patted my shoulder and walked away with this boy. I just sat on a bench, looking around. All I saw were the shadows of people, some on the ground, some by a tree, some just walking. It was so quiet. After a few minutes, I lit a cigarette and I heard somebody whisper, "You got an extra cigarette?" The voice asked. I turned around and saw a man in shadow. "Sure," I said. I reached out to hand the man a cigarette. He took it. "You got a light?" He asked. "Sure," I said, and I struck a match for him. Instead of just leaning down and lighting the cigarette, he reached out to make a cup around the match with our hands, which is something we all do when it's windy. But it wasn't windy. I think he just wanted to touch my hands, because while he was lighting the cigarette, he did it for a lot longer than necessary. Maybe he wanted me to see his face over the glow of the match, to see how handsome he was. I don't know. He did look familiar. But I couldn't figure out from where. He blew out the match. Thanks, and exhaled. No problem, I said. Mind if I sit down? He asked. Not really. He sat down, and said a few things, and it was his voice. I recognized his voice. So I lit another cigarette and looked at his face again and thought hard, and that's when I figured it out. It was the guy who does sports on the TV news. Nice night, he said. I just couldn't believe it. I guess I managed to nod because he kept talking about sports. He kept talking about how the designated hitter in baseball was bad and why basketball was a commercial success and what teams looked promising in college football. He even mentioned my brother's name. I swear. All I said was, "So what's it like being on television?" He must have been the wrong thing to say because he just got up and walked away. It was too bad because I wanted to ask him if he thought my brother would make it to the pros. Another night, Patrick took me to this place where they sell poppers, which is this drug you inhale. They didn't have poppers, but the guy behind the counter said that he had something that was just as good. So Patrick bought that. It was in this aerosol can. We both took a sniff of it. And I swear we both thought we were going to die of a heart attack. All in all, I think Patrick took me to about every place there is to go that I wouldn't have known about otherwise. There was this karaoke bar on one of the main streets in the city, and there was this dance club, and this one bathroom in this one gym. All these places. Sometimes Patrick would pick up guys. Sometimes he wouldn't. He said that it was hard being safe, and you never know. The nights he would pick up someone always made him sad. It's hard too, because Patrick began every night really excited. He always said he felt free, and tonight was his destiny, and things like that. But by the end of that night, he just looked sad. Sometimes he would talk about Brad, sometimes he wouldn't. But after a while, the whole thing just wasn't interesting to him anymore, and he ran out of things to keep himself numb. So tonight he dropped me off at home. It was the night we went back to the park where men meet, and the night he saw Brad there with some guy. Brad was too into what he was doing to notice us. Patrick didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. He just walked back to the car, and we drove in silence. On the way, he threw the bottle of wine out the window, and it landed with a crash. And this time. 
he didn't try to kiss me like he did every night. He just thanked me for being his friend and drove away. Love always, Charlie. May 21st, 1992 Dear friend, the school year is just about over. We have another month or so to go. But the seniors like my sister and Sam and Patrick only have a couple of weeks. Then they have prom and graduation and they are all busy making plans. Mary Elizabeth is taking her new boyfriend, Peter. My sister is taking Eric. Patrick is going with Alice. And Craig agreed to go with Sam this time. They have even rented a limo and everything. Not my sister, though. She's going in her new boyfriend's car, which is a Buick. Bill has been very sentimental lately because he can feel his first year of teaching coming to an end. At least that's what he said to me. He was planning on moving to New York and writing plays, but he told me that he doesn't really think he wants to anymore. He really likes teaching kids English and thinks maybe he can take over the drama department too next year. I guess he's been thinking about this a lot because he hasn't given me a new book to read since The Stranger. He did ask me to watch a lot of movies, though, and write an essay about what I thought about all those movies. The movies were The Graduate, Harold and Maude, My Life as a Dog, which has subtitles, Dead Poets Society, and a movie called The Unbelievable Truth, which was very hard to find. I watched all the movies in one day. It was quite great. The essay I wrote was very similar to the past few essays I wrote because everything Bill tells me to read or see are similar except the time he had me read Naked Lunch. Incidentally, he told me he had given me that book because he had just broken up with his girlfriend and he was feeling philosophical. I guess that's why he was sad that afternoon when we talked about On the Road. He apologized for letting his personal life affect his teaching, and I accepted because I didn't know what else to do. It's strange to think about your teachers as being people even when they're Bill. I guess he has since made up with his girlfriend. They're living together now. At least that's what he said. So, in school, Bill gave me my final book to read for the year. It's called The Fountainhead, and it's very long. When he gave me the book, Bill said, Be skeptical about this one. It's a great book. But try to be a filter, not a sponge. Sometimes, I think Bill forgets that I am 16. But I am very happy that he does. I haven't started reading it because I am very behind in my other classes because I spent so much time with Patrick. But if I can catch up, I will end my first year with straight A's, which makes me very happy. I almost didn't get an A in math, but then Mr. Carlo told me to stop asking why all the time and just follow the formulas. So I did. Now I get perfect scores on all my tests. I just wish I knew what the formulas did. I honestly have no idea. I was just thinking that I wrote to you first because I was afraid about starting high school. Today I feel good, so that's kind of funny. By the way, Patrick stopped drinking that night he saw Brad in the park. I guess he's feeling better. He just wants to graduate and go to college now. I saw Brad in detention the Monday after I saw him at the park. And he looked just like he always looks. Love always, Charlie. May 27th, 1992 Dear friend, I've been reading The Fountainhead for the past few days, and it's an excellent book. I read on the back cover that the author was born in Russia and came to America when she was young. She barely spoke English, but she wanted to be a great writer. I thought that was very admirable, so I sat down and tried to write a story. Ian MacArthur is a wonderful sweet fellow who wears glasses and peers out of them with delight. That was the first sentence. The problem was that I just couldn't think of a next one. After cleaning my room three times, I decided to leave Ian alone for a while because I was starting to get mad at him. I've had a lot of time to write and read and think about things this past week because everyone is busy with prom and graduation and schedules. Next Friday is their last day of school. And then prom is on Tuesday, which I thought was strange because I thought it would be on a weekend, but Sam told me that every school can't have their prom on the same night or else there wouldn't be enough tuxedos and restaurants to go around. I said it felt very planned. And then Sunday is their graduation. 
It all feels very exciting. I wish it were happening to me. I wonder what it will be like when I leave this place. The fact that I will have to have a roommate and buy shampoo. I thought how great it would be to go to my senior prom three years from now with Sam. I hope it's on a Friday. And I hope I will be valedictorian at graduation. I wonder what my speech would be. And if Bill would help me with it if he didn't go to New York and write plays. Or maybe even if he was in New York writing plays. I think that would be especially nice of him. I don't know. The Fountainhead is a very good book. I hope I am being a filter. Love always, Charlie. June 2nd, 1992 Dear friend, did you have a senior prank? I'm guessing you probably did because my sister says it's a tradition at a lot of schools. This year, the prank was as follows. Some seniors filled the swimming pool with about 6,000 packages of grape Kool-Aid. I have no idea who thinks of these things or why, except that the senior prank is supposed to signify the end of school. What this has to do with a grape pool is beyond me, but I was very happy not to have Jim. It's actually been a very exciting time because we've all been busy finishing up the year. This Friday is the last day of school for all of my friends and my sister. They've been talking about their prom non-stop. Even the people that think it's a joke, like Mary Elizabeth, can't stop talking about what a joke it is. It's all very fun to witness. So, by this time, everyone has finally figured out which schools he or she is going to next year. Patrick is going to the University of Washington because he wants to be near the music there. He says he thinks he wants to work for a record company one day. Maybe be a publicist or a person who finds new bands. Sam finally made her decision to leave early for the summer program at the college of her choice. I love that expression. College of my choice. Safety school is another favorite. The thing was that Sam got into two schools, the college of her choice and a safety school. She could have started at the safety school in the fall, but in order to go to the college of her choice, she had to do this special summer program just like my brother. That's right. The school is Penn State, which is so great because now I can visit my brother and Sam with one trip. I don't want to think about Sam leaving just yet. But I did wonder what would happen if she and my brother ever started dating, which is stupid because they are nothing alike, and Sam is in love with Craig. I have to stop doing this. My sister is going to a small liberal arts college back east called Sarah Lawrence. She almost didn't get to go because it costs a lot of money, but then she got an academic scholarship through the Rotary Club or Moose Lodge or something like that, which I thought was very generous of them. My sister is going to be second in her class. I thought she might have been valedictorian, but she got a B when she was going through that tough time with her old boyfriend. Mary Elizabeth is going to Berkeley, and Alice is going to study movies at New York University. I never even knew she liked movies, but I guess she does. She calls them films. Incidentally, I finished The Fountainhead. It was a really great experience. It's strange to describe reading a book as a really great experience, but that's kind of how I felt. It was a different book from the others because it wasn't about being a kid. And it wasn't like The Stranger or Naked Lunch, even though I think it was philosophical in a way. But it wasn't like you had to really search for the philosophy. It was pretty straightforward, I thought. And the great part is that I took what the author wrote about and put it in terms of my own life. Maybe that's what being a filter means. I'm not sure. There was this one part where the main character, who is this architect, is sitting on a boat with his best friend, who is a newspaper tycoon. And the newspaper tycoon says that the architect is a very cold man. The architect replies that if the boat were sinking and there was only room in the lifeboat for one person, he would gladly give up his life for the newspaper tycoon. And then he says something like this, I would die for you, but I won't live for you. Something like that. I think the idea is that every person has to live for his or her own life and then make the choice to share it with other people. Maybe that is what makes people participate. I'm not really certain. 
because I don't know if I would mind living for Sam for a while. Then again, she wouldn't want me to, so maybe it's a lot friendlier than all that. I hope so, anyway. I told my psychiatrist about the book, and Bill, and about Sam and Patrick, and all their colleges, and he just keeps asking me questions about when I was younger. The thing is, I feel that I'm just repeating the same memories to him. I don't know. He says it's important. I guess we'll have to see. I would write a little more today, but I have to learn my math formulas for the final on Thursday. Wish me luck. Love always, Charlie. June 5th, 1992 Dear friend, I wanted to tell you about us running. There was this beautiful sunset, and there was this hill. The hill up to the 18th green where Patrick and I spit wine from laughing. And just a few hours before, Sam and Patrick and everyone I love and know had their last day of high school ever. And I was happy because they were happy. My sister even let me hug her in the hallway. Congratulations was the word of the day. So, Sam and Patrick and I went to the big boy and smoked cigarettes. Then, we went walking, waiting for it to be time to go to Rocky Horror. And we were talking about things that seemed important at the time. And we were looking up that hill. And then Patrick started running after the sunset. And Sam immediately followed him. And I saw them in silhouette, running after the sun. Then I started running, and everything was as good as it could be. That night, Patrick decided to play Frankenfurter one last time. He was so happy to put on the costume, and everyone was happy he decided to do it. It was quite moving, actually. He gave the best show I ever saw him give. Maybe I was biased, but I don't care. It was the show I'll always remember, especially his last song. The song is called I'm Going Home. In the movie, Tim Curry, who plays the character, cries during that song. But Patrick was smiling and it felt just right. I even persuaded my sister to come to the show with her boyfriend. I have been trying to get her to come since I started going, but she never would. But this time she did. And since she and her boyfriend never saw the show before, they were technically virgins, which meant they would have to do all these embarrassing things before the show started to get initiated. I decided not to tell my sister this, and she and her boyfriend had to go on stage and try to dance the time warp. Whoever lost the dance contest had to pretend he or she was having sex with a large stuffed Gumby doll, so I quickly showed my sister and her boyfriend how to dance the time warp so they wouldn't lose the contest. It was fun watching my sister dance the time warp on stage, but I don't think I could have handled her pretending to have sex with a large stuffed Gumby. I asked my sister if she wanted to come to Craig's for the party afterward, but she said that one of her friends was having a party, so she was going to that. That was okay with me, because at least she came to the show. And before she left, she hugged me again. Two in one day! I really do love my sister, especially when she's nice. The party at Craig's was great. Craig and Peter bought champagne to congratulate all the people who were graduating. And we danced, and we talked... And I saw Mary Elizabeth kissing Peter and looking happy. And I saw Sam kissing Craig and looking happy. And I saw Patrick and Alice not even care that they weren't kissing anybody because they were too excited talking about their futures. So I just sat there with a bottle of champagne near the CD player and I changed the songs to fit the mood of what I saw. I was lucky too because Craig has an excellent collection. When people looked a little tired, I played something fun. When they looked like they wanted to talk, I played something soft. It was a great way to sit alone at a party and still feel part of things. After the party, everyone thanked me because they said it was the perfect music. Craig said that I should be a DJ to make money while I was still in school, just like he does modeling. I thought that was a good idea. Maybe I could save up a lot of money so I would be able to go to college even if something like the Rotary Club or Moose Lodge didn't come through. My brother said recently on the phone that if he makes it to the pros, I don't have to worry about my college money at all. He said he'd take care of it. I can't wait to see my brother.
He's coming home for my sister's graduation, which is so nice. Love always, Charlie. June 9, 1992 Dear friend, It is now prom night. I am sitting in my room. Yesterday was difficult because I didn't know anybody since all my friends and my sister were no longer in school. The worst was lunchtime because it reminded me of when everyone was angry with me for Mary Elizabeth. I couldn't even eat my sandwich, and my mom made my favorite because I think she knew how sad I would be with everyone gone. The halls seemed different, and the juniors were acting different because they are now seniors. They even had t-shirts made. I don't know who plans these things. All I can think about is the fact that Sam is leaving in two weeks to go to Penn State, and Mary Elizabeth is going to be busy with her guy, and my sister is going to be busy with hers, and Alice and I aren't that close. I know Patrick will be around, but I'm afraid that maybe since he isn't sad, he won't want to spend time with me. I know that's wrong in my head, but it feels that way sometimes. So, then the only person I would have to talk to would be my psychiatrist, and I don't like the idea of that right now because he keeps asking me questions about when I was younger, and they're starting to get weird. I'm just lucky that I have so much schoolwork, and I don't have a lot of time to think. All I hope is that tonight is great for the people whom it's supposed to be great for. My sister's boyfriend showed up in his Buick, and he was wearing a white tails coat over a black suit which looked wrong for some reason. His cummerbund, I don't know how to spell this, matched my sister's dress, which was powdered blue and low-cut. It reminded me of those magazines. I have to stop spinning out like this. Okay. All I hope is that my sister feels beautiful, and her new guy makes her feel beautiful. I hope that Craig doesn't make Sam feel that her prom isn't special just because he's older. I hope the same for Mary Elizabeth with Peter. I hope Brad and Patrick decide to make up and dance in front of the whole school. And that Alice is secretly a lesbian and in love with Brad's girlfriend Nancy and vice versa, so nobody feels left out. I hope the DJ is as good as everyone said I was last Friday. And I hope everyone's pictures turn out great and never become old photographs and nobody gets in a car accident. That is what I really hope. Love always, Charlie.